Today, we are going to test the idea that we need to talk about Kevin as an ideologically loaded text. Specifically, that it's a conservative piece of cinema designed to condemn non-traditional approaches to motherhood. While I don't necessarily believe this take myself, it's nonetheless fun to see if an argument can be made for it. And I'm going to do this by looking at details in the editing, the framing, and the mise-en-scene, as well as examining the way representations are freighted with meaning. It's vital to note before we start that Ramsey's film is a different beast from Lionel Shriver's book. Although the storylines are the same, Shriver's novel is epistolary, written as a series of letters from Eva to her dead husband, Franklin. The reader is always clear about what Eva is thinking, and she thinks a lot. The book is extremely wordy. This may sound obvious, but the advantage with words is that one can use them to create clear meanings. Eva can debate the nature of guilt, articulate her interiority, and express detailed opinions on specific issues. That's in the book. Ramsey's film is almost the complete opposite, trying to express its ideas through images and performance alone, and favoring expressionism and symbolism over clarity of meaning. As a case in point, the first 15 minutes of the film contain virtually no dialogue at all. The upshot of this is that it traffics in the languages of tone and feeling rather than clear ideas, and is therefore much more ambiguous and open to interpretation which is actually pretty great for film studies. The case for our conservative reading starts in the very first scene. We begin with a bird's eye shot of what, on initial viewing, seems like a satanic blood orgy or demonic riot, but it immediately establishes that Eva is steeped in gore and, by extension here, sin. The fact that it's quickly revealed to be that weird Spanish tomato festival doesn't do anything to alleviate the highly unsettling images. Eva is drenched in red and held aloft as a kind of martyr, sort of Lady Macbeth, unable to escape from her role in the horror. The red is a brutal and recurrent symbol in the film. The paint on the house, the light on her face, and even the canned soup. Ramsey has stated in interviews that the frequency of the colour red in the mise-en-scene is supposed to represent Eva's guilt, so that removes any interpretive guessing about it in case you might have been unsure. But blunt or not, it automatically connects the audience to the idea that Eva is culpable for something, that she is, at the very least, intimately related to the violence. The film also does a lot to link Kevin and Eva. Although the characters in conflict, they are not binary opposites in the traditional sense. And Ramsey employs a number of narrative devices to illustrate this. During the exposition, Eva dunks her face in the hand basin. And as she thrashes around, the shot from below graphically matches into that of Kevin, the implication being that they are one and the same. We see this again in some of the subtleties of habits. Kevin meticulously chews his nails then lines them up on the table in the same way that Eva meticulously removes shards of eggshell from her mouth and lines them up on the rim of the plate. Similarly, mother and son share hairstyles and body language. Both are pale and angular. Both are keenly intelligent. Both of them are outsiders. All of this is designed to establish that Eva is Kevin, that Kevin is a manifestation of her own genetics. So this is the nature rather than nurture argument for her culpability. But one must also look at the aspects of nurture, that is, the environment of his upbringing. The section of the film dealing with Kevin's conception, Eva's pregnancy, and Kevin's birth all illustrate how little maternal instinct Eva feels toward her child. The conception itself is rendered first in red light, then with the microscopic photography of cell division, as if Kevin is an experiment gone wrong, a metastasizing cancer rather than a kid. The shots of Eva pregnant show her turned away from other expectant mothers. While they parade and caress their stomachs, Eva hides hers under baggy clothes, resenting its existence. And finally, the birth itself. Watched without context, any spectator could be forgiven for believing the scenes come from a science fiction horror film. Eva's face is not only upside down, but warped in the convex reflection of a steel lamp. Her features melting and grotesque, her tortured screams disturbingly contrasted with an uninflected medical voice, imploring her to stop resisting. Stop resisting, Eva. Cut to the next shot, and she is sitting broken in her hospital bed. The walls blue and depressing, Kevin and Franklin severed from her and pressed against the side of the frame. A visual representation of their relationship for the remainder of the film. And a shot type that is frequently recycled, whether the two characters are sitting on the floor of their house, or in the prison visitation room. Visually, this is a woman divided from her child, unable to love him as a mother is told she should. 
but it is also vitally important to look at what Eva actually does to Kevin. And here one can list her parental misdemeanors in chronological order. Mommy wakes up every morning and wishes she was in France. Kevin, quit that! You might like it. But if I don't like it? Then you get used to it. Just because you're used to something doesn't mean you like it. You're used to me. Guess well. Christ, Ecuador? For two months? Why can't you send someone else? <sighs> Later, an incarcerated Kevin will tell her that this was the most honest thing you ever did. Indicating he's always known full well that she despises him. By the time Kevin is a teenager and intensely jealous that Eva openly loves her daughter, a final nail in the coffin, he's actively returning the hostility as if it's a sport. It's now what defines their relationship. So when Eva makes a play of taking Kevin on a pseudo date in an attempt to connect with him, he hurls the entire affair back in her face in a devastating diatribe. And finally, once you've sucked up that entire bottle of wine, you can go all gooey-eyed and say how nice it is to spend quality time together. You can scooch you over and put your arm around my shoulder and give it a little squeeze. The final shot of the scene sees Kevin grinning smugly back at his wounded mother. He has enjoyed hurting her, and she is reaping exactly what she's sown. Ideologically, it's also valuable to examine who Eva is, and just as valuably, who she isn't. She is not a drug addict. She is not a fundamentalist. She's not a single mum. She doesn't live in a crime-ridden city. The suburban home is as palatial as it is tranquil. She has established and run her own travel company, and is a successful travel author. Correspondingly, she's the family's central earner, and she has a loving, doting husband who provides a safe and stable environment. It is the very existence of these things that allows the film to shift the blame to Eva. And here one can argue that the film is saying, via its narrative, look what happens when you don't throw yourself wholeheartedly into motherhood. As a subsidiary point to this, the film glamorizes and even fetishizes Kevin particularly as played by Ezra Miller. Miller's Kevin is represented as cool and highly capable. It's like a pinup idol. His fashion sense is idiosyncratic. Strands of his hair fall perfectly across his face. His concentration with a long bow is filmed in obsessive slow motion. And he exudes sex appeal. Visually, the film objectifies his physical form, just as his characterization lends him enormous anti-hero charisma. Look at the way he's matched with James Dean from Rebel Without a Cause. That jacket and those jeans are no accident. In doing this, the film again lays the blame at Eva's feet. Kevin is not some wall-eyed cretin from a broken home. By all rights, he should be popular and successful. A kid with good looks, intelligence and money. Instead, he's a mass murderer. Someone who thinks it's okay to butcher the defenseless and skewer his own sister and father on the lawn. So where does the culpability lie? In this reading, in terms of both nature and nurture, mum has to shoulder it. As Miller himself stated in interviews, Kevin needed a totally self-sacrificing mother. He got the opposite. But at this point, it's important to rewind and go all the way back to the beginning. I hope you rot in hell, you Fucking bitch! Because we've been looking at this thing through the loaded lens of a culturally conservative critique. While it's interesting to look at the film within this particular framework, as a kind of post-feminist attack, it's probably not accurate. The film's aim isn't social criticism, and the style is not social realism. To think about the film as having a socio-political agenda is kind of to miss what the film is actually at its core, which is a psychological horror, not a cautionary tale or right-wing propaganda. And we need to talk about Kevin Works because of its unique mix of genre and subject matter. It's a genre film that's been superbly conflated with a really creepy hypothesis. And as a final point, it's worth noting that Ramsey, ever in favour of ambiguity and active spectatorship, chose to excise some lines of dialogue that appear in the book. But they're illustrative here. 
in this sliced out section, Eva asks Kevin why he didn't kill her too. His response? You don't want to kill your audience. And that's horror. It's not politics.